you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Hosea. And we won't be here very long tonight, but we're going to use a passage here in Hosea, Hosea chapter 1 as our launching off point. Hosea chapter 1, and we're going to look in particular to start off with in verse number 2. The book which bears the name of the prophet Hosea opens with what what we might view as an unusual or even strange command from God to the prophet himself. And notice in verse number 2, it records for us the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. Notice here that the time of this command was given, the beginning of the word of Jehovah. That is, Hosea received this instruction at the beginning of his prophetic work. And what was the specific command God gave him? Well, take unto thee a wife of of whoredoms. Now we might ask, why did God give Hosea this command? Why, Why instruct Hosea to go marry, of all people, a, a, a wife, why take unto him a wife of, uh, of whoredoms? Well, well, the purpose is given he, he, here in the verse as well. It was to teach Israel a, a, a very important lesson, using Hosea's marriage as an object for that lesson. Because God says, For the land hath committed great whoredom, Literally, because of their idolatry. And and remember, that they had issues with idolatry stemming all the way back from Mount Sinai. We remember what happened there in Exodus chapter 32 when when Moses went up into the mount to receive the law. And the people asked Aaron, make us a golden calf. And Aaron complied with them. And when Moses returned, he found them worshiping an idol, a golden calf. Very early, they had departed from the true and the living God and turned to serving false gods. And that's the thrust here of what this word means. In fact, the Hebrew word from which whoredoms is rendered is defined as adultery. But figuratively, it means idolatry. So part of the problem that Israel had, the whoredom they were committing, was they were prostituting themselves spiritually to these heathen gods, the gods of the Canaanites, the Amorites, and so forth. Now as we further think about this command, the the physical unfaithfulness of of Gomer, whom Hosea married in verse number 3, would serve to summarize the spiritual unfaithfulness of, of Israel to Jehovah. Now, with that said, as we come back to verse number 2, as we think about this command, let's think about about it from Hosea's perspective. As we think about what God tells him, to go and take unto thee a wife of whoredom, do you think in your mind that the prophet viewed this as a strange command? Do you think perhaps he thought to himself, well, why does God want me to go marry a wife of whoredoms? Why does God want me to do this? Do you, do you, perhaps, do you think perhaps he was, he was thinking that this was strange? Now, what if Hosea thought, God can't be serious. He can't mean for me to go, go marry, a, take a wife from whoredom. This is strange. So, so because this is strange and because God surely can't be serious, I won't comply. I'll marry someone else of my own choosing. What would have happened? I think we all know the answer to that. Hosea himself would have disobeyed. He himself would have been un- become unfaithful to God because of, he would have rebelled against the will of God. See, this is the important part of the command. It may have seemed strange to Hosea, but it was a command given directly to him from God. When God speaks, mankind better listen. His people especially better listen. And we learn that he did not obey, rebel. He operated out of faith. And in, in God, and did as God said, he obeyed. And so we see very early on, the faith that pleases God is the faith that does as God says. No matter how 
strange man may view God's commands. But I suggest to you tonight, this is not the only instance in the scriptures where God makes a command, command to others that men would view as strange. Now, what are those commands that might be viewed as strange by men? That's what I want us to consider in this lesson tonight. And so tonight, as we think about the will and the word of God, as we think about our faith in God, as we think about the need to submit to God, obey God, I want us to look tonight at strange commands found in the scriptures. And we're going to examine some commands that God gave to individuals throughout the, the scriptures, which might be viewed as, uh, by men, and even perhaps by those to whom they were given as strange, in light of what we have just discussed, of God instructing Hosea to marry a woman of whoredoms. And we're going to briefly note the purpose for which God designed these commands, how men reacted to them, and the consequences of their reactions, and impossible non-reactions. And so in the course of this study, we want to stress that those commands that men would view as strange are designed by God for a purpose. Thus, we will see that these commands are designed by God with His will in mind for mankind, and that it is up to man to respond positively to these commands. So, with this foundation in mind, turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 6. Let's go all the way back to the beginning, to the beginning book of the Bible, and let's go back to the days of Noah to Genesis chapter 6, and let us examine God's strange command to Noah. And we're very familiar with the text. We're very familiar with this incident. As we think about the, the world in the days of Noah, it is described in verse number 5, the, the general condition of man here is that God looked upon the world and saw that the wickedness of man was great. And again, I would suggest to you that when God looks upon our world today, and He is... He still sees that the wickedness of man is great, does he not? But also notice here in verse number 5, he finds that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. That's a sad statement, is it not? One of the saddest statements of the Bible is that the thoughts of man's heart in this time frame were only evil continually. Sadly, when we think about our day and age, there are those living today whose thoughts are only evil continually. And that breaks God's heart. And so when God see this, sees this, we find in verses 6 and 7 that He pronounces judgment on the world in the days of Noah. Because we're told in verse 6, it repented Him that He had made man on the earth. Now again, we understand God doesn't repent in the sense that man repents. We understand that. But it grieved him. And we understand God says, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Again, he doesn't say, I might destroy man or maybe I will. He says, no, I will, emphatic. However, in the midst of the gloom, there is hope. Because we're told in verse number 8, we find a man by the name of Noah and look at how he's recognized by God. He finds grace in God's eyes. He was a righteous man. He, he was a godly man. And as such, God would make a way, God would provide a way for Noah to escape the judgment, the condemnation, the destruction that was to come. And so in verses 14 through 16, we read of God's strange instruction to Noah to make the ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And, and this is the fashion which thou shalt make it. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in it a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. With lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. It gave him specific instructions. Certainly it would seem to, 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 to perhaps know at the time strange. Do you think perhaps he found this to be strange? Build a what, God? You want me to build what? An ark? However, do you think those in the days of Noah who witnessed the construction of this ark found it strange? How do you think those who perhaps looked upon Noah as he was building this ark, and, and, you, and this had to have been in plain view, 
How do you think they perhaps reacted? Perhaps they might have looked at Noah building this ark and just laughed him to scorn. Noah, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you building that thing? That's, that's strange. That, that's odd. Do you think they perhaps made fun of Noah? Why did Noah build the ark? Why did Noah comply with this seemingly strange command? Simply put, he believed God, and he obeyed, therefore obeyed God. Again, notice back in the text, verse 8, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and there's a reason why he did it. Because he was a man of faith. He was a righteous man. Notice what the Hebrews writer says about him in the great chapter on faith in, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 7. It was by faith, Noah being warned of God, so God gives Noah a warning and instructs him. And so what does Noah do? He moves by faith. What does he do? Well, he's moved by faith. The things not seen as yet moved with fear. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. So God got his attention. God instructed Noah what to do and he told Noah what was going to happen. I'm going to destroy the earth with a flood in verse number 17 of Genesis 6. And so Noah believed God. He, didn't, he hadn't seen this thing yet, he didn't, he, but he could grasp in his mind the, just a picture of what God planned to do. And so he moved and built an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Noah, suppose Noah did laugh at or scoff at God's command and did not build the ark. What would have happened? He said, well, I believe you, God. Well, perhaps he might have said, I believe you, God, but I'm not going to build it. He would have perished, would he not? The purpose for this strange command was that the ark was the vessel purposed by God through which Noah and his family would be saved from destruction. Noah found grace. And God revealed its grace to Noah. And so Noah moved by faith and built the ark. And so we see this principle. Noah was saved by God's grace through his obedient faith to this strange command. However, let's move on now. Down through time, let's now move to Genesis chapter 12. And let's look at a couple of strange commands that God made to a man named Abram, who eventually would be called Abraham. In verses 1 through 3, we have God calling Abram. We have a strange command given by God to leave. He tells tells Abram, Get thee out of thy father's country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will, will show thee. Now, how many of us sitting here tonight If we heard these words with scoff, maybe laugh, because we view this, how how strange is this? God telling me to leave my home, telling me to to leave my, my father's house, telling me to leave my friends and neighbors, and to go somewhere I've never been? This is odd. Why do I need to do this? Why should I do this? How many of us, though, would have the faith of Abram in doing as God said? God gave the command in verse 1, but He also gave a promise, verses 2 and and 3. When He said, I'll make of thee a great nation, I'll bless thee. Make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. It goes on into the verse 3, but this was predicated, uh, Abram receiving the blessing was predicated on him going. So what made him leave? What made him heed this strange command? Well, just as Noah, Abraham responded by faith. Perhaps he did not fully understand why he had to go, but he went. Verse 4, Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. 
Look at how the Hebrews writer describes it in Hebrews 11, verse number 8. The same, in the same section, pr the previous verse talked about Noah's faith. Here it talks about Abraham's faith. When, when the Hebrews writer says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, and God called him, we understand that here, when he was called to go out into a place when he should, after, receive for an inheritance. Now notice this word, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. Isn't that an amazing statement of this man? He went. He didn't know where he was going. All he knew was God told him to go, and he went. He trusted in the promise of God. He leaned and trusted in God himself. And he was blessed. We understand how the Abrahamic promise was ultimately fulfilled. Galatians chapter 3, through Christ. Yet I suggest to you tonight, if Abram did not go, if he had disobeyed God and rebelled against God and therefore sinned, God still would have kept his promise made in verse 2 and 3. He would have used another vessel to accomplish his purpose, but again, God's purpose would have been done. Man cannot thwart his purpose, but again, God chose Abram. He, he looked into his heart. He knew his heart. Now we understand that it caused Abram to do it. God's foreknowledge doesn't equal causation, but Abram's faith led him to obey God. But that's not the only seemingly strange command that God gave this man. Let's turn over now to Genesis chapter 22. And let's look at verse number 2. After the birth of Isaac, who was the promised son to him and Sarah, notice what God commands of him here in verse number 2. When he says, to Abraham, take now thy son, but not just your son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. And again, he's his only son in the sense that he was the promised seed. We're very familiar with what happened, the events that transpired when they tried to circum, him and Sarah tried to circumvent the promise God had made. They got Hagar involved and that led to all sorts of trouble. We understand that. But he was to take his only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, Get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him up there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I tell thee of. Why? Why would God command Abraham to do this after he and Sarah had waited so long for a child? In fact, they never thought they would have one, especially at their advanced ages when God had made this promise in chapter 17. In verse number 17. By that time... Abraham was a hundred years old. And Sarah was 90. Can you imagine being 90 years old and God telling you that in, in you, you as a woman that you're going to have a child? Can you imagine men being a hundred years old and God coming to you and saying, you're going to be a father? But Abraham staggered not at the promises as Romans chapter 4 talks about. But why would God do this? Well, verse 1 gives us the answer to test him. We're going to get more into that in a minute. Now, could Abraham quibbled and questioned God and refused? Could he have said, this is a strange command. Surely God doesn't expect this of me. And said, I'm not going to do it. Could he have taken that disposition? Well, obviously, yes. But he did not. Again, you go down through Hebrews chapter 11, and then, and then you look at this marvelous statement made in verses 17 through 19 of Abraham. It was by faith when he was tried. His faith was put to the test. He offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. He remembered the promise of God, but now notice what it happened is in verse 19. Accounting, that the word there is is a Greek word from which our English word logic comes from. The idea of used reasoning, common sense. Common sense told Abraham that God was able to raise him, that is, Isaac, up, even from the dead. He knew God would keep his promise. And he trusted in God's promise. And hence he obeyed God. 
By faith, Abraham did this. It was by faith Abraham was able to deduce from the promise God made that he would fulfill that promise through Isaac. God tested Abraham's faith with this command. And certainly his faith was rewarded. You go back to Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 through 18, and we see the promise reiterated to him once more, with even more blessings pronounced upon him. And you will also find in the same text that God provided a, 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 sacrifi a, a sacrificial ram that he offered up in the stead of his son. Verse number 13. Yes, God made a seemingly strange command. But it was by faith Abraham obeyed. Now, let's move on to 2 Kings chapter 5. Let's look at a third incident, third seemingly strange command, this time to a man who was not a follower of God. And we're very familiar with this, con with this text in 2 Kings chapter 5. Let's here examine God's strange command to Naaman. And we understand who he was, captain of the host of the king of Syria. He was a great man. He was a prominent man. He was a military man, a man of authority. But yet he was a sick man. He had leprosy. However, though, there was a cure for his leprosy. He could be cleansed from his leprosy. Notice, notice verse number 10. We won't take the time to go through all the background at this time because I think we're very familiar with it. But notice we come on down to verse 10. Elisha heard about it. And he, and he said that Naaman shall know there is a prophet in Israel and he shall know there is a God in heaven. And so Elisha sent a messenger unto, to Naaman saying, Go wash seven times in the Jordan River, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Now what, one might snicker and say, well, well what good's water going to do on, with leprosy? How can water cleanse leprosy? Well, I suggest tonight the power isn't in the water. Power is in doing what God says, is it not? You see, grace provided a way for Naaman to be cleansed, and it taught him to do something. Remember, grace teaches us, Titus 2, verse 12. And that teaching was for him to wash seven times in the Jordan. And faith is submitting to grace's instruction. Now notice his reaction, verse number 11. And this is, a, this is a problem we face today. Do, do, do we not as children of God as we seek to teach others the good news of salvation and, and teach them what they must do to be saved? Naaman begins by saying, I thought. Well, I thought. You hear a lot of this in, in conversations with people about the Bible. Well, I thought this, I thought that. It's not a new, not a new mindset. And so he, he says, I, I thought, and he questioned God's wisdom. He said, I thought, he, he'll surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord as God and strike his name over the place and recover the leper. He thought one thing. And his thoughts are not God's thoughts. Now notice he also goes on to say, Are not Abana and the far power rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? Again, he's questioning God. How many people today question God's wisdom? This especially relates to our final point in our lesson, and if you have the outline, you'll know what that final point's going to be. So how did he react to this strange command? Initially, he questions, and now he turns and goes away in a rage. Goes away mad. However, verse 13, his servants come near and ask him, if the prophet had bid thee to do something great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? Obviously he would have. How much rather then would he, he said to thee, wash and be clean? He got it through Naaman's head. 
You do some great thing, but yet you won't do this, follow through with this simple instruction to go wash in the Jordan seven times. He finally submits. Verse 14. He went down, dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to Elisha, according to the prophet. And what happened? His flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was cleansed. You know, if Naaman had not submitted to this strange command, and indeed many would find it odd, but go cleanse yourself in the Jordan River? If he hadn't submitted, he would not have been cleansed. He would have remained a leper. You see what man finds strange, God, find, God has a purpose for God used this as the means, as the conduit by which his grace would be channeled to Naaman. And when Naaman submitted by faith, he received God's grace and having his leprosy cleansed when he dipped seven times in the Jordan River. It's a powerful lesson for all mankind today. Now with that said, let's move on to a couple of prophets very briefly. And let's look at a couple of strange commands to Jeremiah. And let's turn over to the book of Jeremiah now. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 13. Several instances I could have pulled from, but I want to look at very briefly two. God, throughout the work of Jeremiah, gave him several strange commands to fulfill as part of his preaching to the southern kingdom of, Is of Judah. All of, all of which perhaps may have led him to think, why this? This is, this is strange. Let's first of all consider Jeremiah chapter 13. In verse number 1, God tells Jeremiah, go, go buy thee a, a linen girdle. In Jeremiah 13 verse 1. Now Jeremiah said, a, gir a linen girdle? Now, a girdle is something you wear on the innermost part of you. It's a very intimate, part, very intimate piece of clothing. It was worn on the innermost part of man, worn around the waist. Now, Jeremiah may have thought, well, what does a girdle have to do with anything? He tells him, you get your girdle, put it on you, put it not in water. He could have thought, you know, this is strange. Why do I have to do this? I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to do this. But that's not what the text tells us. We're told he got a girdle according to the word of the Lord and he put it on. Verse 3, God comes to him again saying, you take your girdle, which is on your loins, you go to, you, the, you go to Euphrates, which was a long distance from Judah, and you hide it there in a hole of the rock. Now again, here this gets, might get stranger. God tells Jeremiah, Jeremiah, you take that linen girdle and you go to Euphra the Euphrates and you, you, you take it off and you hide it under a rock. Hide it in a hole of the rock. Verse 5, Jeremiah goes. He went as God commanded him. After many days, and this had to have been a lengthy period of time. We're not told for sure how long the period of was, but obviously it was a rather lengthy period of time. God comes to man again and says, you go back to Euphrates. And you take the girdle from thence, which I commanded thee to hide there. And he did, and he went, and he took the girdle from the place where he had hid it, and behold, the girdle was marred. It had become decayed. It had rotted. The text tells us it was profitable for nothing. It became useless. Now what was the lesson God was trying to convey? Why, why did God tell, give Jeremiah this strange command? Why did J Jeremiah go through with it? Well, this linen girdle, just as it was an intimate part of the clothing of man, it signified the intimate relationship that God had with Judah. And so when, when, he, when he did this, this object lesson, this decayed girdle, this marred girdle, re represents the spiritual decay of Judah during this time as a result of their pride. Verse number 9. Their unwillingness to, present, to repent of their sins. And again... They were guilty of idolatry just as the northern kingdom was. Again, let's not, let's not make it look like as if everything was hunky-dory in the south. It was not. 
God gave this seemingly strange command, and indeed, to the, to the casual observer, it would be strange, but to the man of faith, they would recognize God would, was going to use it to teach a lesson, an object lesson. Yes, a strange command, but ultimately, Jeremiah complied. He could have questioned, he could have quibbled, but he did not. If he, had dis- if he had not done this, he would have been disobedient to God. And would have been in the same condition as Judah. Then you go to Jeremiah chapter 27. In the first part of the ver- chapter, God tells Jeremiah to go make you some bonds and yokes. Out of wood, put them around your neck. Now, how many of us today, if God told us to go make us some yokes and bonds and put them around our necks, how many of us would do that? Now, this would be strange, would it not? Why bind yourself? What was the purpose of this command? What was this object lesson designed to teach? Well, number one, God is so master. Number two, God's plans cannot be altered by man, but also in connection with this, it was designed to teach that Judah was going to be brought into subjection to the Babylonians. However, we also learn in the same context, a false prophet by the name of Hananiah came and broke Jeremiah's yokes and bonds and pronounced that the captivity is not going to last long. You're going to go home very quickly, Judah. Don't worry. It's at that point God tells Jeremiah again, you, you make you some more yokes. This time make them out of iron. The purpose for which? You can't break this yoke. You're going into captivity, Judah, and you're going to stay there for 70 years. And there's nothing you can do about it. So, these yokes were designed to teach Judah that God's plans cannot be altered by man. They cannot be broken. And I attempted to do such, but... But God commanded Jeremiah to make yokes of iron, and which could not be broken, he did. Further, as a result, Hananiah died that same year because of his false teaching. But above all, these yokes t- teach, taught Judah that God expects men and teaches us today that God expects men to submit to his will. Again, the same principle is true. If Jeremiah had not done as God said... He would have disobeyed. Oh, on the second part, this, these yokes, he made the first, but what if he had not made those yokes and bonds out of iron? What if he had just allowed this to, to, to continue on? What if he had not did this as God commanded after Hananiah had broken the, the, bond, the yokes and bonds of wood? Again, he would have disobeyed God and subjected himself to God's wrath. So we see Jeremiah acted by faith. He didn't question God. He simply did as God required. Now let's move on to the prophet Ezekiel. Another man. In in the book of Ezekiel, it's a very fascinating book. Got a lot of visual aid preaching here. And it starts off, you get this vivid vision of of the glory of God in chapter 1. But we're not concerned with that tonight. We're concerned with a couple of things we find in Ezekiel chapters 4 and 5. As was the case with Jeremiah, God gave the prophet Ezekiel several strange commands relating to the message he was to preach to those who were captive in Babylon and those who remained in Jerusalem just prior to its destruction at the hands of the armies of Babylon. Perhaps these instructions, these commands may have led Ezekiel to think, well, this is odd. This is strange. This is bizarre. Why does God want me to do this? Consider very briefly three. Notice Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Here we have the sign of the tile. Isn't, you know, as I read these chapters, as I read through this, this is very interesting. You know, this is why I love studying the Old Testament. You know, you get to, this, is, this is thought-provoking. But here God tells Ezekiel, take thee a tile and lay it before thee. He says, put it before thee and portray upon it even the city, even Jerusalem. This is one of those where God is having Ezekiel, as it were, act it out. And he tells Ezekiel, lay siege against it and build a fort against it and cast a mount against it set the camp also against it, and set battering rams against it round about. 
Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged. Now if I'm Ezekiel, how many of us at this point, if we were hearing the same words as Ezekiel, would be thinking, well, this is silly. Why does God want me to do this? Well, there's a reason. God was very serious. This simple object lesson was to carry out, be carried out by Ezekiel to, as a sign to Israel of the siege that was to come against her, in particular Jerusalem. And he explicitly tells us that in verse 3. However, you move on now in the same chapter, verses 4 through 8. We have the years of Israel's iniquity signified by Ezekiel laying on his side. And he tells Ezekiel, you know, verse 4, you lay on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it according to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon it. Thou shalt bear their iniquity. And he tells him, verse 5, for I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days. 390 days. So what's God telling Ezekiel to do? You lay on your side for, left side for 390 days to show forth the iniquity of, of Israel, bearing the iniquity of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, well, this time you turn over on your right side. And you're going to bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I've appointed thee each day for a year. Verse 8. Notice this. God tells him this. God goes on to say, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. Can you imagine what Ezekiel must be thinking? Ezekiel had to lay on his left side for 390 days and his right side for 40 days, a total of 430 days. This is strange, isn't it? Why, God, why do you want me to lay on my side? How many of us would have questioned God or quibbled with God? But Ezekiel went through with it, no matter how strange it seemed to to be. Ezekiel chapter 5, you have a shave and a haircut. And you look at, you look at, God telling Ezekiel to take thee a sharp knife and take thee a barber's razor and cause it to pass upon thy head and upon thy beard. He told Ezekiel, you shave your head, you shave your beard off, and you're going to use your hair for a purpose. And he told him to divide the hair in in sections of of a third. However, verse 3 tells us there were to be a few of those hairs to be hidden as skirts. And the picture that God was going to give, the object lesson was that there was going to be complete and utter destruction. A third, a third, plus a third equals a whole. But yet these few stray hairs indicates a few would be spared. Verse 5, we see what was to be destroyed, Jerusalem. And, he's, and God says this is Jerusalem. However, the few hairs represent the remnant to be preserved whose hope was in God. Just as was, was, was true with Jeremiah, if Ezekiel had not complied with these strange commands, he would have been disobedient and thus subjected himself as well to God's wrath. Now with these examples in mind, we come now to our final point. God's strange command to men today. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Many look upon the command to be baptized as strange, do they not? Some scoff, some guffaw at the notion of water baptism as being essential to salvation. They say, you've got to be kidding. But yet, Jesus taught its essentiality in that verse, did he not? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Some, Some say that to teach water baptism as essential to salvation is to teach water baptism, and that's the furthest thing from the truth. As was with the case with Naaman, the power is not in the water. The power is with God. The power is in God. The power is in doing what He says. We are saved by God's grace through faith. 
We are saved by His grace through contacting the cleansing blood of His Son. In fact, we're told in Revelation 1 verse 5 that it is the blood of Christ which washes away our sins. Now, where is the blood contacted? He shed it in His death, John 19, 34. Romans 6, 3 and 4, we're told that when we are buried with Him in baptism, we're baptized into His death. Can't get much plainer than that, can we? To reject baptism is to reject salvation. And to reject salvation is to accept condemnation. Yet men view this as strange, but yet God designed this, His plan of salvation for a specific purpose. It is by faith we obey God from the heart. We obey that like form of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. God has, God has set it forth in stone. We cannot quibble with that command. When it comes to the commands that God makes of men, all would do well to remember the words that God spoke through the prophet Isaiah when he said, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. God's commandments are not grievous, that is, they are not burdensome, nor are they trivial. They are designed ultimately for our benefit when we submit to them. It pleases God and enables us to enter or to remain in a proper relationship with God. God is indeed a righteous God. Therefore, His ways are righteous. In fact, the prophet Hosea affirmed this in Hosea chapter 14 verse 9. The ways of God are right, and the just walk in them. And that's what we strive to do tonight as Christians. It is up to us, though, as men, humans, to follow His ways by obeying His commands, which are righteous. God knows what He is doing. His plans, purposes, and promises are perfect. The question, that, when it comes down to our view of the commands of God, is this. Do we trust Him? And are we willing to submit to His commands as those we have discussed in this lesson did? Tonight, if you're here, you're not a Christian. Are you willing to submit to God's command to be baptized? But I vote for that. Are you willing to submit to repenting of your sin, to confessing your faith in Him? If you are, come to Him tonight. While also understanding that a failure to do so is to remain in sin because it's to disobey Him. Do we have enough faith to obey God? Do you have enough faith to obey God? As a Christian, if you've no longer obeying God, do you have the faith to return to Him in repenting of your sin, confessing your sin, and praying to Him for forgiveness? If you don't, you have no faith at all. There is nothing strange about doing what God has said. It is foolish, however, not to do, as God says, because of what it means for us in eternity. If we want to be saved, we need to be as the wise man in Matthew chapter 7. To build our lives on the Lord Jesus Christ by doing what he says. And if you need to do that tonight, we encourage you to do that right now. Don't be as the foolish man. Don't build your life on some other foundation. Build it on Christ Jesus by doing his blessed will. We invite you to do that right now as together we stand as we sing.